is not, and she, she goes on to say, this is not the end of it, because Posse is anglicizing, taking words from English and, and causerizing, should I say, um, what we did with words of French and Latin origin to make them look English. We took the suffixes off and made that part look English, and the rest we kept French or Latin or Greek, we kept it like that and put the, something recognizable for people. And what Akosa is doing is exactly the opposite. What they're doing is they are putting a prefix e in front of a clear, clearly uh, English word, and they're giving their own uh, a spelling for that word, like e accountancy. Okay, and it's just going to be spelled a little bit differently, but it is very clear where the origin uh, lies. So they are uh, um, um, amassing a huge number of words. So, so please don't take this as absolutely uh, the, the answer that's got so, so few words. And there's more, more of course, to be said about um, the, the words in, in Tosa, but for another time, because we need to get on. I promised you something exciting, and you are questioning me already. I know it. All right, so the origin Folk etymology, all right? I have to put that in. What is folk etymology before I start on this lovely thing? Folk etymology is where there's a wonderful word history, but it has not been verified. It is not necessarily accepted. It is a lovely story, but in some, for some folk etymologies, they've been refuted completely. Uh, but for others, there, it could be this or it could be that. So one story about the origin of the question mark comes from Alcune of York, a uh, monk, who apparently used a sign like a lightning bolt from left to right, and that was his sign of a question, and that eventually evolved into the question mark. I don't like that one at all. It's not nearly as exciting as this one here. Yeah. No, no, no. Remember I told you that um, before the printing press, Books were copied by copyists, by scribes. And scribes would be copying from one scribe's work. Now, scribe number two is copying that work. He doesn't, he's not able to read. What is that, an A, an E, a what, what is that? So he would then put quaestio in the margin, reminding himself, question. I need to go back to scribe number one and ask him, what, what, what is this now? Okay? And of course, this does mean that when they didn't bother to do that, there's so many different spellings that, that came up during the, uh, the period before the, the printing press. This was very laborious to write quaestio. You, can you imagine writing question? Ask every time. So it would be QO. From that QO, let's now fit it into the margin. It became a Q with a little taily dropped off there. O underneath. From there, question mark. Ah, isn't that the nicer one? And I love that one, and I think it, it makes sense to me anyway. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to put on the board for you, I introduced you to uh, Latin words. Those of you who have studied Latin and Greek, you would know uh, how to spell these, but just for your um, edification, nasci, natus, one of the first, the first word I actually introduced you to is the Latin word for to be born, so we get the word native from that. We also got renaissance via the French, so different, so French. It's, it sounds so much be more beautiful than Renaissance. Okay, Latin was very um, kind of harsh sounding uh, as opposed to the French softened everything. Colore cultus, that meant to cultivate, to inhabit, and we get from there colonial, and we're going to talk more about that today. Any other things about words? You want me to put anything on the board there? Okay, so let's just put on the power. Finally worked out how to, how to work this. <laughs> Technology, not my strong suit. Mm -hmm. Right, we just wait for the light to come on. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so let's just take a step or two back to yesterday that we were looking at the Middle Ages period into the early modern English era. 
And we saw that in the Middle Ages period, Middle English period, are you okay? lights, Marshall, where are the lights? He's my Marshall. But it's actually Marshall, hey. It's related to the God of War, I know it. Okay, better. Okay, so we were looking at the Middle English, and we saw that we had thousands of words of French origin, which I said to you, of course, means ultimately most of them you can trace back to Latin. So the heavy influence still, we have to say, of Latin. Then we move into the English, uh, modern, uh, modern English era. It, se it, it seems a funny word, hey? modern English era, because what are we now? Oh, Ultra-modern, I don't know. So we start off with the Renaissance and the very huge, powerful impact of Shakespeare. He's the king. I mean, he's the king. You know, who said Elvis was the king? No, no, no. Shakespeare was the king. And he was the king of linguistic originality, the king of literary uh, inventiveness. I said to you, he in, uh, created, he coined over 2,000 neologisms um, during his writings, new words. But I just have to, have to clarify that and say also new functions. I think I did mention it briefly yesterday. New functions, new grammatical forms of existing words existing words. So we have, for example, one of the things I gave you was assassination. Assassin was a word accepted, coming from Hebrew, but he made assassination. And only later it became to assassinate. We're finding this kind of what is called conversion happening still today, where we are taking an original noun and we're making it into a verb, or a verb and we're making it into a noun. So conversion is happening all the time. That is also linguistically creative. So we have uh, William Shakespeare, one of the two most influential uh, um, people, writers, influencing literature and, of course, vocabulary. I said to you, uh, Shakespeare used about 30,000 words in his works. Now we're going on to another hugely, sound like Donald Trump, huge, hugely impactful um, things is the, the introduction of the, the um, King James Bible, the translation of the Bible commissioned by King James I to be translated into English, important for, uh, to, to uh, bolster up the Church of England. He wanted that, uh, he, he wasn't interested in the other translations. He wanted one that, that was going to um, deal with Church of England and so on. It is a hugely poetic, poetic uh, translation. There were, I'm trying to remember how many scribes, I think about 72 or something, involved in the uh, translations. They were Hebrew scholars. They were looking at the Hebrew versions. They were Greek scholars as well and Latin scholars. And they would all come together and, and produce this, this marvelous uh, uh, translation of the Bible. They, there was a, a decision to make this a, a work that was going to be uh, uh, more formal. They weren't going to use translation words that were perhaps uh, more to the tune of the modern speaking at the time. So in the writing of the King James Bible, only 8,000 words were used. So they, they kept it as close as possible to the translation they were using from Hebrew or Greek or, or Latin. So not, not using some linguistic creativity as such, but yet they kept it very beautiful and very poetic. The authorized version of, so now it's authorized, this is King James I. We go in and we go all the way up now to 1953. Anybody think of a significant occurrence in 1953? Queen Elizabeth II ascends the throne. Now, when she ascended the throne, she took, of course, the mantle of Queen of Britain, but she also swore to be the defender of the faith. And to that end, the Bible that she said we will be using is going to be the authorized King James I Bible. And any child that was born in the year of her coronation received an authorized version of King James the Bible. That is how important she felt that this is. And if we go back even now to the time of when this Bible was first uh, introduced and for the centuries going on, <coughs> for the, the families who were maybe not learned, 
just average, um, maybe some of them hadn't gone to school, whatever, they would aspire to own a Bible for the family. That Bible would be what they, their exposure to, written, to the written word, not just the word of religion. It's, we're talking about the word of, of English and, and, and how to assimilate it and how to uh, enjoy it better, the written word. So, and it was very, very expensive. So people would save for a long time because originally this was still, before the printing press is going to be, you know, there was some, still some you could buy that had been copied with the printing press. Still fairly expensive because quite a big tome, uh, but that is what they would use. So, unfortunately, we can't go in this. It's, it's, I should have included it. You see, I've given you some interesting books to read. There's another wonderfully interesting book about King James, the Bible, with some fabulous things in it. So, apart from giving us, you know, the, the, for the people who Church of England, etc., the King James Bible, let's see very interesting words and phrases, well, more phrases that this Bible has has given into English. So even if, if you are not uh, a religious person, if you're not a biblical scholar, doesn't matter. You will know, you will recognize what has come into general usage in English. So we look at my brother's keeper. Lordy, lordy, lordy. I probably did say that. Um, my brother's keeper, an eye for an eye. To spy out the land. The signs of the times. Out of the mouths of babes. How are the mighty fallen? There are many, many other instances and examples. But just to see, this is a, a, a very influential work of literature, not just religion, that has given us um, great um, idioms and so on in English. Oh, now we move to the modern English era. 1650 onwards. Oh, my goodness. Now, here we are in 2017. As I say, I think it's a bit of a misnomer that we're still in the same period. We should be calling ourselves... I don't know, ultra-modern. We must invent a word. Anyway, modern English. Let's see what happens now. We have, because of the uh, uh, printing press has been uh, brought into to Britain, this is fantastic. There's now the move towards standardization of spelling. You've got all these anomalies of spelling with the various um, um, books, and now you want to standardize it. So indeed, we've got a, a start of the standardization, but we're still waiting for the dictionary. There were some word spelling lists, etc., available, but we haven't had an authoritative one yet. We have also different, um, this, the printing press gave rise to different types of writing. So we're not just talking about books. Suddenly you're looking at the first newspaper. What is that going to bring in? At headlines, a different way of writing. You know, you're going to talk about, uh, we'll see also the radio, etc., coming in. That's also going to give uh, rise to different types of speech. 18th century, okay, grammar is going to be formulated according to Latin and Germanic grammar. As I explained yesterday, we're looking at the order of words, Germanic, the endings, the inflected endings of Germanic being dropped away and simplifying the English, all right? but still labeling so many of the grammatical functions according to Latin. Oh, now here's an interesting man. Here, enter the first dictionary that we take seriously, all right? And this is Samuel Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson. He wrote the first authoritative dictionary, 1755. It took him nine years to write. Okay, uh, a hell of a lot shorter, of course, than, than the Oxford English Dictionary, but nine years. And he basically undertook this task himself. He had a couple of students who assisted him in finding out this, that, and the other. But this is Dr. Johnson's Dictionary. But I have to just say, now when you look at that, he had about 50,000 words. <gasps> We're talking about the Oxford English Dictionary, 650,000 words. So what happened to the other 600? Well, they hadn't grown yet, but... The actual words in circulation were much, there were much, many more. I've already shown you, 120,000 in the, in the uh, modern e English era. So, wow, what did he leave out? You know, dictionaries are, are written by humans. So it is the humans who make the decision about what goes in to the dictionary. What gets dropped out of the dictionary when it's no longer functioning? Ah, it's an archaic word, we're going to drop it out. So, he was a Puritan. He refused to put in any words, swear words, no profanities allowed. He was very careful, anything that was 
pejorative, except we'll see what he does himself, any kind of word he didn't like, he didn't put it in, right? Too bad if you wanted it, not there. So we look at some uh, uh, examples here. <laughs> so lexicographer, there's another Greek-based word for you. Lexis means word, graphene is to write. We already had that in yesterday's orthography, the graphy meaning writing of or recording of, so orthography, correct, uh, uh, writing the correct spellings. So this is a writer of dictionaries, and this is his definition. A harmless drudge that busies himself in tracing the original and detailing, detailing the signification of words. That's his definition. <laughs> Definitions have to be created by people, okay? He says, a patron, one who countenances, supports, or protects. That's pretty neutral, all right. Commonly a wretch who supports with insolence and is paid with flattery. <laughs> then a little bit of social history we can see here. Oats, a grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, huge uh, um, strides into standardizing our spellings and, of course, giving us a, a resource to go and find uh, definitions, albeit we might not agree with some of them. Now, we have Noah Webster's dictionary comes in quite significantly well, but it's sort of less than a century later, but Noah Webster, an American, he writes a dictionary which he feels must reflect American pride. We have thrown off the shackles of British uh, um, imperialism. We are independent now, so we need our own dictionary. Now, of course, that for us, you know, in, in, in South Africa, we still use British spelling, and so when we see this, this thing, you go on the computer and it's, it's auto-correct and it comes up the American spelling, you go, what now? You know? But there is the power of that, of that uh, American spelling. Uh, America is a powerhouse anyway. So he started off, he wrote two volumes which covered quite a lot of science, scientific, technical, a little bit of medical uh, terminology. But he took pains to choose words that were American, that reflected the American culture. So the word like plantation, you didn't have that in Britain, there were no plantations, but he needed to put it in, quite understandable. Congress, their choice to, for their, their, their uh, political system to actually go back to Latinized, Latin-based words, Congress, okay? They love the Capitol Hill and the Congress. And so he put those words in and that, that was great. Uh, the, the British really didn't like this at all because apart from the new words which were particularly American, what, what they were critical about was his decision to change some spellings. He said, listen, this word colour <laughs> has now, what is the point of the U there? It, it came th from Latin, it was colour. It's interesting, huh? Color, C-O-L-O-R. There was no U in Latin. But then it went through the passage of French. Oh, and the French wanted to soften it and bring in their own little identity. So the U appears in that period. And it stayed with our British spelling. So he says, no, it's not necessary. I'm dropping it out. Much to our chagrin. He's done it with, obviously, a lot of, a lot of the words. And um, the British people said, OK, I'm listening to your uh, justification. Mm -hmm. But what about, because he said there's no, no need for it at all. He said, what about um, the word like, I'm just trying to think, <coughs> can I make up one now? Colorization, or no, 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 that's not one. I'm trying to think of another interest. Where in English, with color at the base? Let's think of one. No, we're still going to put a U in there. Neighbor. Labor, ooh, okay, yeah, let's take that one's better word. I'll come back to this color in a moment. So, labor also has a U. He didn't want it, so he's gonna just make it L-A-B-O-R. So the British say, no, 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 no. If you're gonna follow this, you've gotta follow it all the way through, say, I don't want the U because it's useless, okay? But he said, you're not following it through because then, what would you say, laborious? That, that's gonna, but that's, that's a plain O, you see. I'm just, where, where, moment, please. 
We've got, he, he messes things up a little bit. Let me see if I can find it. Mm. He messes it up. He tries, he tries to, uh, yeah, here we are. Words, words, words. Let's find, find it over here. All right, so he says, he says here. Okay, so forgive me for this one. So he wants the OU, the U out of the OU endings, and they didn't like it. He wants the, he wants CE instead of the SE. And the British said, why, why? We wanted to make a distinction between a defense and a defense. Why are you doing this? I said, he says, but why do we need that? Why do we need the distinction? No. So much to the uh, irritation of, of, and I'll come back to color, whatever, whatever, I'm somewhere else, but I'll find it. Uh, much to the irritation of the uh, British, his work started gaining ground. And well, we can see it. We can see it in, in the internet, the fact, the power of the internet that you can go and you're typing, typing, and it's gonna automatically correct you with the American, unless you're gonna put in the British. So the power of the internet, the internet, World Wide Web, is the biggest resource of written texts ever in the world, ever has been and probably ever will be. So, you know, we are bound by that. And American spelling is, is intruding upon that. So he says, this is according to him, it was partly a matter of honor as an independent nation to have a system of our own in language as well as government. So again, you know, we talked about linguistic pride, that when, when we had these invasions in Britain, the English, the, the Britons, the Celts, whichever period we're looking at, they were so excited when the invaders left or they were assimilated, they could take their linguistic pride back. So people have a pride in their own language and uh, certainly the Americans as well. What I want to just mention before we move on, and I know how to do this now. Yes, 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 yes. What I want to mention is we see this huge uh, amalgam of words coming from French, from Latin, and of course to the existing English. So what this gave rise to is quite an interesting phenomenon. Okay, that's enough. It gives rise to where three words mean similar things, but they come from different roots, and we use them in a different sort of register. So for example, we will have rise, we look at the etymology, Germanic, okay, Old English. We will look then the French, mount. We will look at ascend. This we would still trace back to Latin, by the way, but it is going to be the sort of French that they, they put in for us. You would look at something like king, royal, regal. Three languages, but they've become English, anglicized, and used with similar meanings, but in different circumstances, different contexts. And we will see when we talk about uh, the words from Latin origin and Greek origin that in using them, they are of a higher register. So, you know, if you're chatting to your friend, you're not going to say, are you going to ascend the stairs today? <laughs> no. You go, I'm, gonna, I'm going to rise and climb, use an uh, ordinary one. You're not going to mount anything. You know, no. Um, he's the king. But if you're going to behave in a regal way, that's kind of more formal, isn't it? Right? Kingly would be a little bit less. So very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon occurring at this period. So what we've seen also, this period that we've just talked about, that early modern English, the Middle Ages, was the start of that amazing uh, uh, ability or love that the English have of borrowing from all over the place. Shakespeare, their very own, our very own, our very dear, said, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Well, no notice about that. <laughs> the English, very happy to borrow from all over the world. So, we're moving into the 19th century. What, what big things are happening here? Well, what happened just at the beginning, towards end, late, late 18th century, beginning 19th century, this standard English has and emerged, and it's kind of the English that we understand as standard English today. A few twitches and changes here and there, but 
the loss of inflections, the spelling has been standardized, the grammar is standardized. So we're looking at an English we understand, that we can still understand today. But what historic cultural events happened in the 19th century that impacted upon uh, our English language, particularly our vocabulary? Well, it was a time of amazing um, uh, strides in medicine, science, technology. Now, for all of these words, you've got to find a word. You can't say, listen, this little thingamajig, okay? You say, that thingamajig has got to have a name, and if medical, the doctors have to think, oh, yeah, so now I'm operating on this guy's back. And I've just found this funny little thing here. Hmm. For the life of me, it looks like a cuckoo's beak, which is a coccyx. So I think we'll just call it a coccyx, coming from the Greek, that's a very nice word, then everybody knows what that is. So they were tasked if, uh, with finding words for these medical, scientific, and technological advances. Where did they look? Mostly they looked to Latin and Greek, because with, encapsulated, usually in one word of Latin or Greek origin, you can say one word. It says a lot that requires, in everyday English, a lot of words to describe. So it's very much um, um, more to the point, and so that is where they looked for roots of these new words. They would, of course, uh, anglicize a lot of them by putting an English suffix on, so it seems familiar to us, but they nevertheless are the roots. We have the invention of the telephone and the radio. Oh my goodness, people thinking this is going to be just terrible. I mean, they were shouting into this instrument. They think, how are they going to hear me? And this is going to stop all social activity. It's so scary. What do we need this thing for? Radio. Well, radio, the same thing that you're using the, the radio waves, radium, giving us the rays, how this was created. And um, radio, oh my gosh, do we need this? It's going to so be destroying the fabric of our society. But of course it did not. And in fact, what it gave rise to was to new types of speech. You now have the broadcasting, which is, you've got sports broadcasting, which is a particular type of speech. If you love your, your rugby or your, your cricket, you're listening to the broadcaster. He's going to be short. He's using particular kind of words. You've got um, what other kind of weather broadcasting. Most of the, the, the TV stations have got a, a dedicated weather person standing, and now we're looking at here, and the rain's over there. A, whole, a person doing just weather, okay? So this was a very big uh, thing that grew and grew and grew and still grows today, although, of course, um, we've got the in internet, we've got the computer. Now's the one, and the gentleman was asking me about something about this. This is the big thing. British colonialism, what is British colonialism? That is where the Britons, they have become the powerhouse now. They are now wanting to expand their borders, not dissimilar to the Romans. When the Roman Empire was expanding, we're great, we're powerful, expanded, 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 and they went out into all corners of the world. So the British wanted to do the same for reasons of commerce, Trading, we know they landed up here in South Africa. We're on the trade, trade route for, uh, for India. And this now brought in hundreds, no, no, I think it says thousands of words from other languages because they were meeting with different peoples who ate different foods, who wore different clothes, who had different devices or things that they, they, they used as transport, whatever. Now, instead of trying to find a word in English similar to that, I thought, well, I don't know one. So if I'm going to try and describe this, I'm going to have to describe it. Let's try and describe saffron. What are you going to do to describe saffron? Said, well, it's, it's very thin, it's a, it's a spice, and it's, I mean, how are you going to do that? So when they went and they saw, what, what is this that you're putting into the food? It's called saffron. Right, we'll call it saffron. Why? Why not? Why not? So they were happy to do that. And we have an enormous number of words. Look at, look at the extent of the, um, oh, yes, it dropped off a bit there. But we're looking at the British Empire all over the place and words coming from there. Let's look at some examples of words. These are called loan words, 
borrowed words. I'm just picking just little, little, little. So from Hebrew, what everybody uses, amen or amen, rabbi, messiah. Okay, we all understand what those mean. You can imagine. So that fellow who is, is, is donned with this particular garb, what, what, what is he? He's a rabbi. Oh, right, okay. So you don't want to describe this in saying a priest who speaks Hebrew, who studies rabbinical te- We call him a rabbi, okay, right, that sounds fine. Yiddish, uh, interesting, from Yiddish we get kosher, kugel, chutzpah. Now one would think that Hebrew and Yiddish would belong to the same language family. One would think, yeah? I mean, I would think so anyway. But in actual fact, it is not so. You have, your Hebrew is a non-Indo-European language. It doesn't belong to the family tree of Indo-European languages, which is where we position our English. English, I said to you, was a Germanic in the Germanic families, together with your Afrikaans and your, your um, Scandinavian Dutch and so on. Yiddish fits into the Germanic family. Because of the, the um, migration, the movement of Jews into Germany, they then were assimilated into Germany and they created, geographical disconnect, eh? they created their own language. And we have to also remember that Hebrew was not, modern Hebrew was re- resurrected not all that long ago, really. So this is a Germanic based language. Arabic, we get Admiral, Saffron, here, there we go, Mattress, hadn't seen that before, what is that that you're lying on? You're recalling it, it's nice and soft, but they did it a different mattress, okay. Zero, coming from Arabic, um, in the Roman numerals, I'm not sure, I'm hoping we'll have time to look at Roman numerals and origins of words from uh, Latin numbers, I hope so, I'm not sure that we'll get that far, but the Romans didn't have the concept of zero. They took it from uh, the Arabs. Alcohol, Arabic, anything actually with this little prefix al, so is going to be um, usually uh, Arabic. Because kind of the, the same thing as saying the. Hungarian, Finnish, Turkish, oh, people love their food. Look at this, goulash, yes. Paprika, you know, in, in, in Britain at the time, I don't think they had goulash, they would just have summa stew. <laughs> Paprika, lovely spice, and of course, the clothing, turban. Now you can imagine the British going and you're meeting new peoples and they're wearing different garb. They say, well, what is that you're wearing on your head? So say, it's a turban, or they might say, it's fez. They go back, nobody at that time in Britain was wearing a turban or a fez. So they had to have a word, they took it back and said, this is, this is actually what this is. Today, Britain, uh, like much of the world, multicultural, multilingual, and so on. So you would be, go to Britain, you'd see lots of people with turbans and lots of people using, wearing fezes, that's, that's fine. But it was not at that time, not at the time of this, this um, reaching out to the rest of the world. Coffee, caviar. Yeah. Chinese and Thai, we're looking also at foodstuffs and we're looking at clothing, silk coming from here, ginseng, tea, and you know, it's funny when you, uh, if you listen to some um, kind of local English, British, they'll say, do you want to come and have a cup of cha? A cup of cha. So when you go and look up the origin of tea, you will see it is cha. So it came directly in from that. Ketchup, did you know it was not the Americans who introduced that? Hey. No, ketchup <laughs> comes from Chinese, and they describe it as a tomato-based sauce. So today we think, American, definitely ketchup, I want some ketchup. Japanese, kamikaze, tsunami, sadly we've seen so much of that sort of in recent times, haven't we, shame. Tycoon, soy, another foodstuff. Malayan, Polynesian, gingham material, bamboo, and junk, not in the stuff that's in your garage, junk as in a type of a little boat. American Indian, caucus, wigwam, moccasin. They didn't, they'd go and look at these, where, you, where are you living? I'm living in a wigwam. There were no wigwams in Britain, so we have to just say, right. 
You might have been forgiven to think that caucus, with the US ending, my Latin compatriots here, that that would come from Latin, but it doesn't. Uh, it's actually an American Indian word. So I always put that to my students. I say, OK, odd one out. Which of the following words is not Latin in origin? Hmm. <laughs> Mexican Indian, oh yummy, foodstuffs again, avocado, tomato, chili, and clothing poncho. Inuit, ex Eskimo, also wow, where do you live? I live in an igloo. How do you describe they live in an ice house? Okay, so we'll just call it an igloo. Kayak, their particular type of canoeing, and which has become, of course, now favorable around the world, canoeing. You've got that uh, Oxford Cambridge, um, uh, rowing race, the big rowing race, and so people are very familiar today with what a kayak is, what a canoe is, but it was not so uh, in Britain at that time. African, we also give rise to lots of words, zebra, bundu, banana, okra, yam, foodstuffs once again, and of course the animals that they had not seen, and we're going to go bundu bashing, yes, we'll see some other ones uh, as well, Afrikaans giving us felt, trek, Bucky. Bucky was introduced into the Oxford English Dictionary in 2010, along with tackies. <laughs> because you say to somebody from overseas, have you, have you brought your tackies with you? <laughs> what? Are you, are you bringing your walking shoes or your what? trainers? Trainers? <laughs> tackies, yes. Biltong, rooibos, and of course rooibos, I didn't realize that this, but um, we, we'll talk about it as we're moving on. Yeah, uh, Rooibos is particularly a product of South Africa, and it is a trade name. You're not allowed to use this, call anything Rooibos, that if you've even got the same bush overseas, doesn't matter, same as champagne. So we'll come to that just now. So yes, we're very proud of Rooibos. Hindi, Basmati, Chutney, Bungalow, Veranda. They didn't need the words in, in British English, bungalow and veranda. You go to Britain, you're not having these big verandas because you don't need to keep the, the heat out. You want to bring the heat in. So verandas were not, not things to have. Bungalow, the same idea of architecture. Shampoo coming from Hindi. And then very, uh, very own homegrown is Vuvuzela. We have exported this notion, we've exported this machine, which people hate, of course, which makes such a loud noise. But from our 2010 um, Soccer World Cup, very interesting thing happens. You can see this is a tubular shaped, um, like a trumpety shape. And in 2010, how wonderful and coincidental that here in the Western Cape, a new flower was discovered. Now, this vuvuzela coming from the Zulu supposedly to make a vuvu noise, vuvu, okay? It makes more than that, I think. And so we have the flower of the iris family discovered in 2010 in the Western Cape. And here we had the Soccer World Cup here, yeah, you know, there was one of the things here. Yeah. And of course, we will talk about it when we come to our um, talking about the Linnaean uh, um, or dealing with classification of plants and animals and any living things. Everything is classified according to the Linnaean system, Carl von Linné, and so that means the first, when, when this was discovered, the first thing, anything new that's discovered, if it's a butterfly, uh, a fish, uh, anything, you've got to apply to the international body of nomenclature, where they apply the binomial, bi is two, no meal, binomial classification of every living thing according to Latin. Now, this was not the case. It was originally according to Greek, all right? But we'll, come to, we'll talk more about that. But what I'm just going to briefly tantalize you again, so wait for this part. But just to tell you, the first one, morai, moraya, it's got the Latinized ending there, is the iris. And then they said, please describe for us what this plant looks like. So they wrote and they said, well, it looks like a vuvuzela. <laughs> so they said, what's a vuvuzela? Well, is it a trumpet-like thing? And they said, okay, we'll keep it a vuvuzela. It's got a Latinized sort of ending, so that looks bad. Yeah, so you can look that up as uh, one of our plants. 20th and 21st century, poor, we know all about it. We are, yeah, we are not the technologists of the world. Uh, you know, that's the millennials and pre-millennials. Technology makes explosive uh, advances. I'm quite uh, amazed. Queen Elizabeth 
Wow, she sent her first email in 1976. I think I probably only sent my first one in about 1986. I don't know. Um, so that's, that's amazing, electronic mail starting there. World Wide Web, which we take so for granted now. I mean, do you ever think of anything? You just go www, okay? World Wide Web. It's not that old. 1991, but look how it has grown and how we've come to depend on it. 1998, the Google search engine was invented. All right, so I've put a little asterisk there. In 1996, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, that Google in the next slides. So internet, okay, there we've got our internet. Now we have SMS arriving. So World Wide Web is there. Now we've got 2000, we've got texting short messaging service. Blogging, ah, uh -huh. yep, okay, 2003. 2004, Facebook. YouTube, 2005. Twitter, 2006. It is said that Twitter today, about hmm, 6,000 tweets are sent out per second. <laughs> 6,000 tweets per second. That's probably conservative. WhatsApp, I love WhatsApp, yeah. WhatsApp is 2009, and now we've got Instagram, ching, ching, ching. So what we're seeing in the evolution of words, which we are now gonna be almost ready to move into, is we're seeing with these, these uh, creations of social media, they are creating words with them. They are also reflecting society reflecting how it is kind of a me, myself, I, and let me get myself out there and whatever. It's, the social media is, is big, uh, a big influence. Okay, so resources. I've given you a little handout there. So this is, absolutely, there are many more dictionaries. I've just put these. You may at home have a dictionary, Collins, the Oxford Concise. No one owns, unfortunately, or can own the huge thing. I wish I could. Oh, my God. Anyway, they're so expensive. Even, even the big two-volume one is very expensive. But you, you might have Merriam-Webster. Be careful. That is an American dictionary, okay? So her spelling. But they've been very nice in the latest uh, dictionaries, both in, in um, the Oxford, British, from that British point of view, and from the Merriam-Webster, they're giving you both spellings. They will say in brackets, American spelling, or <coughs> Merriam-Webster will say uh, but British spelling. So they're highlighting there is still this distinction in spelling. There are a lot of websites you will find, because you are all interested in words, it is a fabulous thing to go onto the oed.com. There are so many things to, to click on there. They are amazing. There are 40 videos. That, that are created by the team, the team of the Oxford Dictionary. The Oxford Dictionary's got a, averagely about 200 scholars and res, uh, uh, resource researchers, no, 200 yeah, scholars and researchers, about uh, another 200 readers, which is where people reading anywhere, anywhere in the world, they are readers, you must read any type, internet stuff, any kind of written thing, and if you come across a new word, you will put it into a data bank, and every time you see that word, it goes into the data bank. This is how that Global Language Monitor, did anyone go and look at that, by the way? No. Global Language Monitor, how they are able to say, oh, I see that this has come in, it's in this data bank, and I'm going to now click on it, and, and they say, oh, that's appeared that many times. You have to have 25,000 citations where this word came from. Where did it, when did you see it? And this is what will go in. But it's fascinating. So really well worth, not just, you're not going to be reading the dictionary just for definitions. You'll see such interesting things on this website, okay? Uh, then dictionary.com, Oxford Dictionaries, Cambridge, Merriam-Webster. You're going to have a lot of, when I, I say, let's go and investigate a word. Where, what's the history of that word? Interesting word, which I've asked you to look up a few to, tonight, maybe, if you want to. Etymonline, etymology.com. Word detectives, you're going to be word detectives, word origins, there's a number of sites, very interesting things. So now, you're going to, um, I've asked you at the bottom of that first, that one page that you've got to look up some, some interesting etymologies for me. So what, is, what do I mean by that? I, I want the linguistic history. So how, how are you going to be looking for that? You will go into the dictionary, and if it's, if it's uh, following a sort of, formal, standardized way of doing things, 
Well, all etymologies are in reverse chronological order. So my interest would be, can you take me all the way back to the first language? Where was it born? Where was it born? So in other words, if you, you go to a dictionary, um, you know, like a small dictionary. I'm afraid with dictionary size does count. OK, yes. You're going to go to this dictionary. It's going to take you only back to, say, French. If it's saying French, go and find a bigger dictionary. It's going to take you back to Latin, all right? So we're looking at reverse chrono chronological order. But there are different ways that dictionaries do it. And of course, they are also becoming modernized and saying, we, we're online now. So some dictionaries will just put in origin, colon, da 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 da. The formal thing would be square brackets. Mm. And there are others, they'll say derivative. Let's have a look at some examples. So the language from which, you, what, the way it'll go is, the first thing you see when you find the etymology will be the language from which this modern word is taken. That's, eh, I'm not, not, I'm so interested in that. Nope. The form of the word in that language. Mm, no. Nope. The linguistic history, ending with the earliest form of that word. Yes, and they'll give you the, the form of that word. So let's look at the word. That is currently, thank you, Donald, um, <laughs> one of the most looked up words. It's not a new word, but it is one of the most looked up words in, the 20, in 2016. I'm going to give you a list of those when we get to the evolution of English language. Misogyny, fascism, etc. Most looked up. They've skyrocketed. So just look at this. It tells you. This is a very different way of doing it. it comes from Greek. Misos, there's the word. Misos means hatred. Gune or gyne means woman. And it gives us misogyny. And they tell you it come, came in uh, meaning this in the, the 17th century. You don't have to worry too much about that. I just want to see, can you see where it comes from? But just this piece, this little slide I've put in. Look at neutral meaning, hatred of woman. OK, here it comes. This, yeah, it's kind of used, kind of used, kind of used. Whoa, used a lot. And whoa, used. Whew, in 2016, right up there. <laughs> so we look at the Oxford Dingle English Dictionary's uh, way that they're going to put in this um, misogyny. You've got, your, you've got your pronunciation, misogyny, and it tells you a bit there. And of course, the Oxford English Dictionary gives us citations of the dates, where these things, where did we see them first? You know, that's going to be listed for you. But essentially, uh, we're looking, it tells you straight it comes from Greek. There's the concise Oxford. That's a little bit less misogyny, very simple. Also, 17th century from Misos, hatred, etc. And the Collins giving us something pretty similar. So it doesn't matter how you get the, uh, to the, um, to the uh, etymology. Notice in this one, a Collins one, they're using the square brackets. That, for a lot of the older dictionaries, that is how you will find your etymology. Okay. So that's the end of that section. Um, so do you want questions, or do you want to start on the next little bit of evolution of English vocabulary? How are you feeling? A little bit, so we can start? OK, right. Yay. OK. Yes. The, the vowel should, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to attend yet. Oh, OK. So can you insert a few words, very few? OK. Uh, the great vowel shift. The, uh, this occurred now whew, when vowels had one sound, and for some unknown reason, there was a linguistic shift, and that sound changed. So, so let me say, if I take night as in opposite of day, it would be nicht. I. Then it becomes night. And no problem, no problem. You may ask as many as you like. Oh, English created those, so we can we can bring it. No, we borrow from anywhere. Particularly when we get to the Latin section, we're going to see, say, uh, if we are borrow borrowing from a noun, let's say the word, the word formula, okay, we, yeah, or 
We will now, well, that one's a bad one because that keeps the Latin ending. Um, miles militis means a soldier. So I can take that noun from Latin and I can make it into military as an adjective. I can make it into militant, another adjective. I can make it into militarize as a verb. So we have absolutely no borders. I can take a verb, a Latin verb. We could take kedere kesus to go, to yield. And I can say, I can make that into um, procession, a noun, proceed, a verb, uh, proceedings, a different kind of noun, procedure. So oh, English is amazingly variant. It'll do all, it doesn't matter at all. One of the questions is pronouns. Oh. In Latin and Greek, don't have Ah. Okay, so Latin and Greek, the pronoun is in the ending of the verb, okay? Where the pronouns themselves came from, that's your, going to be your Germanic. Well, I think that was the latest. Oh, is that, was that your question? question pronouns? Wait, I thought you were talking... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so pronouns were, were separate, standalone things. In Latin, as in Corsa, since we were talking about Corsa uh, earlier, the pronouns are absorbed by the word itself. So we don't, we very rarely, you ha we do have pronouns, but we very rarely use them as a subject, unless you're just being very egocentric, maybe. You know, like ego, doing this, you don't really need them. Um, so, yeah. Oh, where did the pronouns come from? Ooh. Well, they are Germanic, all right? So I'd have to look whether it was originally proto, the Proto-Indo-European, because how that impacted if going through to, um, to the areas of Europe and so on. But of course, the Romance languages come from there too, so, so they evolved their own. Uh, yeah, I'll have to, I'll think of that. So I think it's worth mentioning when you were talking about the question box, mm. But in Latin and Greek, the point of a question is, is identified by the grammatical order of the words mm -hmm. and some of the words in there have no mm -hmm. uh, So they didn't have question marks as such, they got the question across to the... Which was, which is, sure, which was beautiful when the order of language was following Latin. So where your verb is at the end or your question ne is at the end, you'd know, you'd know that that's, that's where it stops. I can take a breather, okay? That's your question. The ne at the end. But ne, ne at the end, can also be at the end of the first word. It doesn't have to be the end of a sentence. Mm. Okay. Can, can we come and chat about that afterwards? But maybe it's time rather to do question time then. Or do you want to do... Okay, do you want to come chat to me afterwards and then we'll formulate something? Okay, all right. We'll just have a little start into, in, in, into this uh, second uh, section. We're going to look at the evolution now of vocabulary. We've been looking at how English evolved as a response to all of these, these invasions, to various cultural uh, um, events and people like Shakespeare, etc., giving us more and more words in English. But now, how does English continue? To evolve. What, what happens, what has happened and what continues to happen? We look first at the Latin word, evolvere, meaning to roll out. Volvere, to roll and e is out. So it's the gradual development of something. So we've seen a development over time. Things are speeding up now, that is for sure. It's not so gradual anymore. So we're just going to look at one thing today, and that is neologisms, because you're familiar with that word. I've told you that Shakespeare created so many of his own new words. Not an easy thing to do. Maybe uh, easier to change the grammatical function, but it's not an easy thing to do. Neos is new, logos is word. So what is a neologism? Okay, completely new word created without any connection to existing words or roots. So we look at, for example, words that are no longer neologisms, but they came into English as neologisms. And when you look at the etymology, that says unknown. We don't know where this word came from. So these are no longer, the asterisk saying, no longer neologisms, all right? These are accepted words, all right? Dog. Now, the Germanic word for a dog was hund, okay? The hound. So English took in hound. Where did dog come from? Well, we have no idea. Some person must have had this little animal, and somebody said, oh, that's so cute. What is it? Uh, dog. <laughs> and then as you go to the next person, you know, it's like that, that, that chain, you know, what, what did you say, what did you say? 
I said that that's a dog. Oh, really? Yes, okay. And so it became dog. You know, no reason why. Jam, as in, you know, the jam on your, on your bread. An interesting word in itself, because now I'm, I'm giving you the etymology, uh, the, the, giving you this as a neologism, jam as the stuff you eat. But of course, there's an example. We've taken this word and we've made it into a verb to jam up something. Okay, creativity of English. So, jam, I have no idea. We don't know where it came from, but it's probably some little little tyke tugging at mommy's skirt and apron and saying, what are you making, mommy, what are you making? I'm, uh, no, she doesn't want to say, I'm actually taking the rind of the orange and some, some juice and some sugar, and I'm, no, uh, I'm making jam. Okay, jam it is, jam it is. Many neologisms uh, were created out of onomatopoeic words, cuckoo, just sounds like a cuckoo, buzz, the word boy, the word boy, no etymology for that, no known origin of that word. Okay, and you'll also see, I think I've given you the word girl as well to look at. Hijack, well, it doesn't mean hijack, it's, we know what it means, but somewhere, I don't think a jack was involved at all, but it came to mean being held up. Condom, well, phew, you know what the French say. The French say this is an English cap, and the English say it's a French letter. Yeah. Anyway, condom is the neutral one. 2014, 2014 word of the a neologism is oversharer. Oversharer is somebody who shares too much information on the social media, okay? Stop oversharing. Oh, today I got up at 8.30 and I had a cup of coffee and it was so lovely. Who cares? Right. Ah. Brexiteer, 2016. Coming from Brexit, which in itself is a, a new coinage uh, which has been accepted. We look at a new combination of existing words. This can also be a way uh, that we call neolo neologistic. Gender fluid, that's our 2016, 2017, one of the, the words now that is going into the Oxford Dictionary. We'll wait and see whether it stays. It'll come in first as, as colloquial, uh, then we'll see whether it's going to stay. So we've got gender fluid, a person whose gender identity and gender expression is not fixed and shifts over time or depending on the situation. Right. Sharenting. Sharenting, also a new word. It's a blend of a word, by the way. Sharenting, where the, the uh, parents share too much about their children on social media. Oh, and little Johnny scored his first try. Of it. Inconvenience fee. This for example, Mariah Carey is demanding a $50 million inconvenience fee from James Packer, her fiance who dumped her, saying he is highly inconvenienced her. <laughs> she wasted her time. So she wants an inconvenience fee. Sleep divorce. A sleep divorce is where you uh, decide as a couple you no longer want to sleep in the same bed or in the same bedroom. But you're not going to divorce, it's only about the sleeping arrangements. <laughs> Digital divorce. You can go online now and do your own divorce. Okay, much cheaper, much cheaper. Bird's nest parenting. That is where the parents are divorced, but they keep the family home, and instead of the children going one week to dad and one week to mom into their two different places, they stay in their family home and the parents come in. <laughs> you know, like when the bird goes, mommy bird and daddy bird go to get the worms for the little chicks, they come back to the nest. <laughs> You can have a new meaning for existing words. A mouse. Give that about 60 years ago. Would have just been described as this little gray furry creature that women scream when they see and jump on a chair. Now we're looking, I'm looking at my mouse. Oh, my mouse is not working. Icon, a Greek word meaning simply a statue. And now we look at the icons on our computer. Twitter used to only refer to birds or girls who were giggling, you know? Now we've got, I'm tweeting, and he sent out so many tweets, and Twitter, the Twitter feed. And it's created a whole lot of other words. Twitterati, okay, the Twitter sphere, yes. And of course, make America great again. A new one is hyphen, not a hyphen, apostrophe, America, short for America. And uh, so we'll see what happens with that one. 
And then, of course, new meanings for existing words in slang, where, I don't know if you've heard children, <laughs> youngsters say, that's so sick, Granny. I said, oh, no, really sick? What, are you not feeling at all well? What's happening? That means, great. <laughs> that was really a wicked thing to do. Wicked, wicked, bad. No, it means it's cool. And even cool, what about cool? <laughs> and then lastly, we look at adulting. This is also where somebody, your 25-year-old daughter or son phones you from their digs and, guess what, mom? I'm actually cooking supper tonight.